Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to part two of this section on optimization for machine learning. We started out part two with uh, you know, a short introduction and discussion that the heart of machine learning really is about function approximation and that we, given some data, want to learn a unknown relation that maps input z to output y. Right? And so we had this relation f of z maps to y. This is the, the unknown model f that we want to learn. Basically, the pixels of an image are mapped to a class of object that we had seen in the image or today's weather data is being mapped to tomorrow's weather data. And so we have a model that predicts the weather maybe. And so this f is unknown, and what we then identified was that we are trying to find a model function h that replaces our f. Right? And given some data, so tuples zi and yi, it's called supervised learning because we have inputs and outputs. We want to find the very h that minimizes this uh, so-called loss function l. Right? So what this is, is given a data set of size capital N, we take the mean over all the samples and then the, the, the squared distance, the, the Euclidean distance between the input being mapped forward by our model and the output. And so what we said is that there is a key component which is the hypothesis space H. Right? So what we said is this model H is an element from a hypothesis space H that we can define. So we are not working in thin air here and saying any function can be chosen, but we're saying H is an element of this big H. Let's say big H is the space of linear models or maybe all neural networks of a given fixed architecture. Right? We will get to neural networks in more detail later, but these are the things that you can do. So what we need to do is, and this is what this video is about, is discuss a little bit the choice of the hypothesis space and then Let's try to refine this optimization problem so that we can implement it into a computer algorithm in the end. Okay, so what this is about is the choice of H. Okay, so what can I pick as my hypothesis space out of which I'm selecting my, my model and um, well, what, what options are there and what does this have to do with my, my optimization problem in the end? Okay, so the first thing one can do and what we have seen already previously is we can say that we are interested in a linear model. So what this means is my H of Z and now I'm adding a second parameter W, a second argument, this is my parameter, so um, is W transpose times Z. So if I have an input vector of dimension uh, D, I have D weights and this is the inner product between the weights and the inputs. So now my hypothesis space would be like this and the weights really determine which models are or contained in this big H. So any W I pick gives me a little H which is an element of this hypothesis space of linear models. But we don't have to stop here. This is obviously you know, has its own advantages because training is very easy, but it is also quite limited in terms of what type of relation you can express here. So what you can also do is you can use linear models with features. So the structure is basically the same, but we define a feature vector. So my age now of z and the, the meaning is the same here of the weights w is again w transposed not now times z but psi of z. So this is sort of a dictionary of functions or a feature dictionary that we can use to you know increase the expressivity of our model. One example might be of this a polynomial model so for example, which would mean that this is H of Z and the weights W is something like W0 plus W1 times Z plus W Q minus 1 Z to the power of Q minus 1. 
Okay. So this example is very special because the Z is now a scalar input. So uh, you can extend this to higher dimensional input Z, but this, the way I've written here is for scalar inputs. And so you see, instead of having a single input, the feature vector really creates Q dimensions. So a constant, a linear term, a quadratic term, and so on, until the order Q minus one. So this is another way of now, well, now our capital H here becomes the space of all polynomials. And so the task again comes, becomes picking the best polynomial, so choosing the weights appropriately, that this polynomial has the best input to output mapping, so the smallest loss. And then of course these are both linear methods and you can really solve them in closed form. Then there's a more important class now for, for this section, these are the nonlinear models. So anything where the W does not enter in a linear fashion, right? So recall, a linear model does not necessarily mean that it's linear in my input. It means that it is linear with respect to the weights. So you see, independently of whether I do W times Z, or I do W times a lifted version, a, 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 an expression of Z in terms of features, this will always be linear in W. And so here I have nonlinearity in W, and I said this a few times, um, what we can think of is a neural network as an example, and we will get there in detail, but let me just briefly sketch it. If we have a neural network, then you have something like, um, or let's start with a sketch, and then I'm going to do my formula. So here is my input Z, and what you usually have in these is you have sort of a, a mapping from nodes to other nodes. So here is the dimension, uh, the dimension of the input is now two, so Z1 and Z2, and this is being mapped to a new internal state. We will get there, as I said, and then this is being mapped to an output Y. And these connections can be assigned with weights. So this would be the first element of this, this hidden state is this constant times this plus the constant along this line times this entry. So we have weights here in the first layer and we have weights here in the second layer. And so what you see is, um, what we get is, usually there's a, a nonlinear activation function assigned with this. So our model becomes and this W now covers all these weights. This is a matrix multiplication of this internal state. And this internal state is matrix multiplication of the input and then composed with a nonlinear activation function. So we have W2 times some nonlinear activation function of W1 times the input. Okay. And this is oftentimes a nonlinear function, let's say, for me this is the tangent hyperbolicus, so a nonlinear function. And so you already see that, well, this is in the same spirit as the models before. We have an input, and now here the input is multiplied by a matrix, then we apply some sort of nonlinearity, point by point, and then we multiply with another matrix. And you see there's a key difference. Here we had a linear ent uh, ent entry of, of W, here we have this one still enters linearly, but this one doesn't because it's inside of this 10H. So it's much, much more challenging to, to train this. So, but what does this have to do with, with everything? Um, what I said is this is about the hypothesis set, okay? So we always have the W here as a parameter. And this is a notion that we see in all machine learning algorithms. We have this hypothesis H, our, our model that we are trying to train. But really, we have a parametrization of this model in terms of weights. So here, these are these neural network weights. Here, I have the coefficients in front of the features or in front of the inputs themselves. So all of them have in common that we have parameters. W, and I'm going to say that these are Q. The number is Q, right? So this is not a coincidence here. I had Q weights for this polynomial model. I'm going to say that W1 and W2, all the elements together are Q. So this becomes a Q-dimensional problem. And now I started out with this one. 
And what does this mean for my learning algorithm? This is now the question, right? So the learning algorithm becomes this. But as you see, the model is now defined by the parameters. So what I get is, I get minimizing, but not over some vague age, but I'm now minimizing over my weights of my hypothesis space. And then the loss function is the same. So it's again one over n, and then the sum over all my samples. I minus h of zi, and now the weights w. So you see, basically the same. All I've done now is the model is now not something arbitrary, but is it's a fixed neural network architecture. It's a fixed fixed feature space or it's the input space itself. And I'm selecting the perfect weights to, yeah, well, perfect in the terms of minimizing this function that this is now the best model. So this is what I'm going to call the loss function, but now it's a function of the weights w. And so here we are going to discuss how to minimize this loss function as a function of these weights, right? And this concludes right, this brief discussion about um, the hypothesis space. Um, one thing that I would like to, you know, comment on a little bit before we close is a question that I'm not going to answer now, but you should already think about this. If I minimize this loss function, is this really learning? Right? So I'm minimizing this given data. I find the best model. Have I learned something, yes or no? And it's not an easy question to answer. We will go there in, in detail a little bit later. But you should already think about this because just minimizing this does not immediately guarantee that we have learned something. But this is it for now. And the next video will cover the question of how we can minimize this loss function using an iterative procedure, which is known as gradient descent. Thank you.